Welcome back, geology fans. Now that we've covered the igneous rocks, born of fire, it is time to flow along the paths of weathering, erosion, deposition, and lithification and settle into the sedimentary rocks. We noted in the rocks overview that these are the rocks that are made of pieces of other rock, or are monomineralic without being too recrystallized, and are often slightly less dense than metamorphic or igneous. The sedimentary rocks form in layers and are the only rock type to commonly contain fossils as they form at the surface of the earth where most life exists. Just as igneous rocks could be divided into two main types, intrusive and extrusive, so we can divide the sedimentary rocks into their two main types, chemical and clastic. To understand this division better, let's take a closer look at how any original rock could become a certain sedimentary rock through the processes of weathering, erosion, deposition, and lithification. Now, weathering involves breaking the parent rock into smaller pieces and can take place either chemically or mechanically. Chemical weathering is also called dissolution, as it involves dissolving the rock material into solution. The best and by far most efficient solvent on Earth is water. The Mickey Mouse molecules of H2O are polarized like a magnet and so can pull on positive cations with their negative ends and yank negative ions with their positive ends. This becomes especially effective if the water is hotter and or more acidic. Rainwater falls as a natural acid with a pH of around 5.5, so natural rainwater is the perfect solvent to dissolve rock. The other way to weather rocks into smaller pieces is mechanically, meaning breaking the rocks physically. Thermal expansion and contraction of rocks can cause them to fracture, especially if there are sections of the rock that expand and contract more than the rock around them such as when salt gets in bedding planes between silica-rich material and pushes the layers apart when the salt thermally expands in a mechanical weathering type called salt wedging. One of my favorite places in Texas is a granite mass called Enchanted Rock, called so for the odd popping and creaking noises the exposed intrusive batholith makes in its daily baking in the Texas sun and then dumping that heat back into the Texas sky at night, allowing the intrusion to daily thermally expand and contract. Repeated expansion and contraction leads to the rock fatiguing and fracturing. Root wedging is one of the more photographic forms of mechanical weathering, starting from a little seedling in a small crack and burgeoning into a proudly standing rock-splitting tree. Root wedging is a slow and steady force working day or night, while thermal forcing is a daily and annual rhythm. Similarly, water can be a daily and annual forcer through its freeze-thaw cycle in what we know as frost wedging. This gaping hole near Pagosa Springs, Colorado, is a rather dramatic example of frost wedging, having been shoved open by water percolating down and then freezing and expanding and opening the hole wider and wider. We previously mentioned that intrusive igneous plutons could take on an apparent layering from the mechanical weathering process called unloading, which happens much more rapidly and dramatically in mine wall and quarry floor explosions when rock bursts out against a suddenly removed burden. All these ways of breaking rock without dissolving fall under the umbrella of mechanical weathering. If I took a rock and hit it with a hammer, that would be mechanical weathering. Though chemical and mechanical weathering are distinctly separate events, dissolution leading to dissolved molecules, mechanical weathering in solid particles called clasts, the two are tied together in nature as chemical weathering can weaken a rock, making it more easily weathered mechanically, and the mechanical weathering breaks the rock into smaller and more and smaller and more pieces with exponentially increasing surface area, and chemistry happens at these surfaces. Chemical weathering aids mechanical weathering, and mechanical gives back to chemical in a positive feedback, breaking the rock at our surface of our world down into broken clasts, and dissolved ions. The smaller clastic sediments also tend to move more easily, and leaving the parent rock to go on to a new home is the next step in making our sedimentary rock. The initial movement is given the specific term erosion, and the subsequent movement of the material can also be called erosion, but I'll try to stick to transportation to make a distinction between the initial removal of material from the parent rock, 
erosion versus moving those pieces of rock away from the parent rock, transportation. The agents that cause erosion are the same as those that cause transportation, so they're very tightly linked. And from a physics point of view, we know we're adding kinetic energy, which must be supplied by some force over time. In the case of gravity, it is the force itself that pulls constantly on the rock. And the steeper the rock face, the more sheer stress gravity induces along the rock face. Failure of the material structure under this force causes rock falls and landslides, both rather dramatic cases of erosion and transportation. Another dramatic but currently worldwide diminishing agent supplying a force for erosion and transportation is ice, ice in the form of glaciers. Glaciers flow downhill like a plastic battering ram, and together with gravity can move the largest clastic pieces, but also moves material down to the smallest clastic pieces. This wide range of sizes is not seen when wind is the agent of erosion and transportation. Wind tends to take material that is sand-sized or smaller into its transport train, resulting in much smaller and better sorted clastic grains, uh, meaning they're all about the same size. Deposits that result from wind-transported material, called aeolian deposits, are fine-grained, meaning smaller clasts, that are well-sorted, that is, they are all about the same size. So we have gravity, ice, and wind, so the last agent of erosion and transportation is by far the most important on Earth. Water is the most important agent of chemical weathering, an efficient mechanical weathering agent through frost wedging, and by far the most important agent of erosion and transportation of both dissolved and clastic sediments. Bed load and stream flow is the largest clastic particles being transported and consists of pieces that are rolling or bouncing along the stream bottom. The smaller clastic grains stay in suspension due to turbulence in what we call the suspended load, or turbidity, of the stream. The third and final way water transports material is in the dissolved load, all the solutes in the water solution. And all this dissolved load can in turn come out of solution when the temperature and or chemistry reaches the point of saturation with the particular mineral species the water chemistry can form. This is a type of deposition called, logically enough, chemical deposition. And this leads to the first of our two types of sedimentary rocks, the chemical sedimentary rocks, which by the nature of their reaching the saturation point of a single mineral at a time, tend to be monomineralic, that is, one mineral type, but not too recrystallized as the monomineralic metamorphic rocks are. The other type of sedimentary rocks, the clastic rocks, are those that are formed when either bed load or suspended load come to a stop and deposit themselves. Logically, this is called clastic deposition, and it makes the clastic sedimentary rocks. The term detrital is often used in exchange for clastic, but I'll just hope you commit that to memory here, and I'll continue on just referring to these as clastic sedimentary rocks. Just knows that detrital sedimentary rocks are the same as clastic sedimentary rocks. But in our story, we have only deposited sediment as a loose pile, and have yet to turn it into a rock that holds these sediments together, what is known as lithification. We can achieve this jump from sediment to sedimentary rock through the lithification processes of compaction, minor recrystallization, and cementation. Compaction doesn't work too well with clastic grains sand-sized or larger, but is fairly effective with the extreme surface area rich fine grains of silt and clay, which also tend to have electric charge accumulated on their surface, making them stick together even better. It's easy to wash apart a sand, and it's not so easy with a clay that sticks together. Recrystallization is the melding of separate grains that are being pressed so strongly together that atoms jump from one grain to another. That makes them slowly become one. We will see much more of this process with the metamorphic rocks, but uh, our last lithification process is the most important here for sedimentary. Cementation. 
Many clastic sediments allow water to pass through the grains, and this water assuredly has dissolved ions in it, which can reach saturation and begin precipitating out as a cementing plaque to take our loose sediment grains and glue them into a much stronger lithified rock. And here again we find that nature does not like to be pigeonholed. A pile of sand is clearly clastic in nature, not chemical but it gets cemented by a process of chemical precipitation. So, is it clastic or is it chemical? We say the grains tell us the most information about the processes at the surface of the earth that existed, allowing those grains to settle in that environment of deposition. And so these cemented particles fall into the clastic sedimentary rocks, and we would call it a sandstone. But when we come back next time, we'll begin with the monomineralic chemical sedimentary rocks, how they are formed, what information they can tell us, and what delightful names we give them here on Earth Explorations.